choice said that you, uh, you lost both your engines. If I was flying the plane and we lost two engines, I'd be a lot more anxious sounding on the radio than that. And my plane has four engines. So the fact that he's remaining so calm, losing both engines on the aircraft is really impressive. Here's how the whole video plays out. Great Lake 007 with you. Uh, 007, Great Lake Project 1, South Timber 3006. Say approach request for the landing. Visual 27, any for Arrow 007. Arrow 007, Roger. Looks like visual approach only to left. Visual for landing, Arrow 007. Arrow 007, I just want to verify. The choice said that you, uh, you lost both your engines. Affirmative. RL007, Roger, you can uh, descend at class, Russian maintain 3000, and uh, just about to the airport inside your uh, your taller clock, one five miles. Okay, now hold on. This plane has lost both the engines, so they're essentially a glider. It means he can't control when he's going to climb or hold an altitude, but the controller says this. RL007, Roger, you can uh, descend at class, Russian maintain 3000, and uh, just about to the airport inside your uh, your taller clock, one five miles. This is funny to me and not funny in a haha way, but it's very different how this guy is acting with these pilots when they lost both their engines compared to when Sully and Jeff and that crew lost their engines. This is some audio from when that happened in real life. I right, Cactus 1549, it's gonna be left traffic to runway 31. Not able. Okay, what do you need to land? Now the difference between the two is you have Soli and that crew getting told they can have wherever they want to go and then you have this pilot being told, okay, you can descend to 3,000 feet, let me know when you see the airport. Well, they can't maintain 3,000 feet, so it's very weird to me that they're not just getting cleared for all runways at that airport. Descend and go to that airport. Everything's clear. You can take whatever runway that you want. It should have been the clearance. I'm not sure if maybe there was something going on underneath there that they couldn't do it, but the plane can't maintain 3,000 feet. So it doesn't really make sense to only give them to 3,000 feet because on that clearance that the controller is giving them, technically, the pilots aren't allowed to descend below 3,000 feet. So. It doesn't really make any sense, but sometimes it's a habit you get into. You might be used to only letting people down to 3,000 feet and handing them over to a controller, but this is what he says. RL-007, Roger, you can uh, descend at class, crush and maintain 3,000. Now it's a really common clearance, and basically what he's telling the pilots is 15 miles ahead of you and directly in front of your nose, 12 o'clock, because we're flying with a clock, imagine that. 15 miles ahead of you, 12 o'clock, right in front of you is the airport. He's trying to give the pilots a heads up on exactly where to look because it's not always in front of you as you can imagine. In this scenario, they're going directly to the airport, the shortest, quickest possible way they can get there. So they're giving them a heads up of just how far out to look. Now this is a really common clearance because what you're gonna have is air traffic control when they're giving you a visual approach, meaning you're not flying a normal procedure to come in and land there, but you're just visually looking outside the plane to try to find the airport, which in this scenario you're gonna want to do and get there as quickly as possible. He's saying, look 15 miles ahead of you and directly off your nose. 12 o'clock is directly off the front of the nose. So that's what he's explaining to these guys of where to look. And the problem is, is that if you're really heavy or depending on what altitude they're at when this clearance comes in, and I don't know what their altitude is, but depending on those two situations, they may not be able to glide 15 miles. If they're at 30,000 feet, well, yeah, they can glide 15 miles. They can glide a lot more than that, but they might be only at a couple thousand feet. And if you're very heavy, you may not be able to make it those 15 miles to glide out there. And the other thing I want to note here is just how cool their call sign is. Air Royal 007. I mean, that's pretty awesome. I mean, I would rather not have that call sign and not have that problem, but either way, it's still a, it's still a pretty cool call sign here. All right, here's what happens next. So, yeah, I don't think we're going to make landing for 007. 007, I'm sorry, say again. Uh, we're not going to make landing for 007. 007, Roger, Mason, reports at your 9 o'clock, 8 miles. Uh, uh, turn left heading 240, that will put you on a heading there. 240, you may be wondering how they know, now 15 miles away from the airport, how they're not going to make it. You've heard the term flying by the seat of your pants. Sometimes when you're flying, you got to go just back to the very basics, which is the opposite of what you get taught when you become an airline pilot. Because when you become an airline pilot, you have to rely only on your instruments. Because they don't want you to use sensations in your body, which could confuse you. In this situation, meaning it's daytime, they're looking outside the window of the plane, they're looking for where the airport is, it's different. You're going to just have to trust and feel that feedback from your plane and that's going to be coming through the place that you're sitting, the seat of your pants. So that's where that term comes from, flying by the seat of your pants. There was no time for calculating. I had to rely on my experience of managing the altitude and speed of thousands of flights over four decades. You're saying you didn't do anything? I eyeballed it. You eyeballed it? Yes. 
So in this situation here, you just have to realize that they were originally gonna go 15 miles and now they got cut to an airport that's eight miles away. So it's a lot closer. And they're saying, hey, we're not gonna make this 15 miles, but eight miles, sounds like they may be able to make it. And that's why the pilot, or that's why the controllers decided to cut them in on that shorter one. And now it's not directly ahead, so now they have to make a turn, which means they're gonna start losing altitude because they're in a bank. But I wanna talk about this part right here. Well, your service of Roger Mason reports that your 9 o'clock, 8 miles, uh, turn left heading 240. That'll put you on a heading there. You may be wondering why Mason now? Why, why would they pick Lansing first and then change their mind to go to Mason? This is Lansing. You see they have three runways, so they're going to have airport, fire, and rescue. There's a lot of things that you're going to have if you land there. And if you're flying your plane and now it's essentially a glider, you want to have things like airport, fire, and rescue there to be able to help you because there's a possibility you go off the end of the runway or you end up crashing. And if you have fire trucks and firemen who have that equipment to be able to get you out of this aircraft, which could potentially be on fire, you want to have that there as an option. My guess is they were hoping to make this runway here, 28 left. It's a nice 8,500 foot long runway, which is long enough actually to land a 747. But for Mason, I don't really have that fancy chart, and you're gonna see why in just a second. I only have access to airport chart for my 747 can land, and they probably don't want me to have any crazy ideas like trying to land here on a 75 foot runway that's only 4,000 feet long, which is definitely not gonna work on a 747. Now Falcon could easily land there, and truthfully, if, if it push came to shove, I could land a 747 in that distance if we really had to do it, but it wouldn't be an ideal situation. However, even on a 747, you'd rather have 2,000 or 3,000 or all 4,000 if you were really good feet of runway that you were stopping on before you went off the grass than nothing at all. Because at least you're gonna have some traction on a road, you know there's gonna be some clearance for your wings even though I'm guessing this airport you'd probably be chewing up a lot of grass and fence and who knows what. But either way, you'd rather have that initial contact with pavement than you would if you were to go land in a field or on a road where there could be uh, electrical lines or, or telephone lines, things like that. So really, any runway that you're gonna be able to get on for the first couple thousand feet is gonna be better than no runway at all. All right, here's the next part. Hey Mason, the runway's 4,200 feet long, 75 feet wide. Roger, we got the airport. Arrow zero, zero, seven, clear visual first to Mason, uh, Jewett, uh, runway at your discretion. Clear visual to Mason, our runway at your discretion, runway at your you have to admit this pilot is staying extremely calm, all considering the circumstance. He has no engines, and now they're going to an airport they weren't planning to go to. It's eight miles away, and they're not even headed directly to where they should be landing to land on that runway. They're coming at an angle. So they have a lot of things going against them to get to this runway and land, and it's not very long, 4,000 feet. Yes, you could land a 747 there if you were light and stop. It wouldn't be something you would ever do on purpose, but you could, you could do it. They could land there. The problem is, is that they don't have time to go all the way out and come straight in and land there. They're now on a situation where they don't have any power. So they got to get as close to the beginning of the runway as they can without hitting it short. And they can't get too far down the runway because there's only 4,000 feet. So if they plan and try to cut it in too tight, they're going to go off the end. It's a really tricky balance and it's something that you, you might do once or twice in the simulator, but these are real world scenarios. You got wind to factor in, your weight of your aircraft. There's a lot of different things that are gonna be different than they are in the, in the real world versus the simulator. And if you were a passenger looking out your window at this being the airport that you were gonna land at, you would pay a lot of money to get out of that situation unharmed. Notice these big white bars here, those are a thousand feet down the runway. So there wasn't a lot of opportunity for a mistake. The pilots were able to land on that tiny runway and escape with minor injuries. Obviously the plane was damaged. I don't know how much damage was done, but still on the grand scheme of it, losing both engines and planning to go to one airport, then changing and going to another airport, landing there safely, getting off the plane, and then only having minor injuries is incredibly impressive. Now you might be wondering, how does something like this even happen? How do pilots run out of fuel? Because that's a concern that a lot of people have and it's a fair concern. You can have that happen, it's happened before. But this is a unique circumstance. Now, I have not seen a report on this. I actually had the exact same question when someone sent me the audio. I looked it up and nobody seems to know for sure because there's not a full investigation that's published yet. But the rumor is this is what happened. Now, this is just the rumor. I don't know for sure that this happened, but this is the rumor of what happened. Now, I pulled this picture off the internet, but essentially, a plane is gonna have multiple fuel tanks 
so that way the fuel isn't flopping around or sloshing around as you turn left or turn right. Then they typically have these types of tanks right here. These are known as feeder tanks. These tanks are where all the outside tanks pump fuel into and those tanks go directly into the engines. So those feeder tanks are always gonna be full. But there are valves that feed these feeder tanks and they can be closed. So if somebody were to close those tanks to the feeder tanks, you would have feeder tanks that had a bunch of fuel in it and then no way for that fuel to get into the feeder tanks after you got up in the air. That is the rumor of what happened. I don't know that to be true, but that would give you the fuel to start your engines and do everything to head out towards the runway and take off. And then obviously when those feeder tanks ran out of fuel, you have no more fuel and no way to get there. And all your indications on your gauges would show, hey, everything's fine because your tanks are full of gas, but there's just no way for the fuel to get in there. So that is the rumor of what happened. I don't know that to be true though. This plane right here had a similar situation except the pilot caused this, where they changed the fuel tanks to pull from a tank that didn't have any more fuel in it. Essentially what had happened is that plane had four different fuel tanks, two on each side. And what you had to do is manually say, I want the inside tank or the outside tank. That pilot ended up, I think, taking the inside tank when the outside tanks had gas or the other way around. I don't really remember. Then he ended up flaming out both engines flamed out both engines and didn't realize until almost right before they hit the ground, hey, oh my gosh, we, we need to switch the tanks. Anyway, they, they switched the tanks, but just not in enough time and they weren't able to make it to the runway. The smaller planes, even though there are two engines, you, you have to give it some time for those engines to speed up and start up and do all the things that you need to do to get an engine running. And obviously they didn't make it to that runway. The pilot was fine, minor injuries. I, I remember hearing about the story because I was flying around that area at the time. But that's an example of the pilots basically causing that exact same problem to themselves. However, in this situation with this Falcon 20, the rumor is, is it was closed. They didn't really have any access and you can't change that manually. If those feeders get cut off, then there's really not much you can do except land. And then some people in maintenance are, are going to have a, have a lot of answering to do. Now, this next video is going to be about something going on in China that I experienced when I was a newer pilot flying in Asia all the time. I remember the first time I heard this radio call was from a Chinese military calling to, I believe, a Japanese carrier or U.S. Uh, US plane. And it, it sounds very abrasive, very aggressive the way they talk on the radio. It's a lot of posturing that goes on. The first time I heard it, I thought, oh, man, it's stuff about to really like kick off over here like while I'm in the air because on like a 12 hour flight a lot of things can happen so we're up in the air and we're thinking oh man oh at least I was and I remember talking to the other guy like wow what's going on is this normal oh yeah it's it's pretty normal stuff but you're going to hear an exchange between uh, the Chinese military talking to a military plane this is something that's very common for me but then somebody who sent me this video put something in here that that really made me laugh you got to check this out Station calling U.S. military aircraft. Please identify yourself. Uh, this is the Chinese Navy. This is the Chinese Navy. This is the Chinese Terror Sky. Please go away quickly in order to run judgment. I am a United States military aircraft conducting lawful military activities outside national airspace. I am operating with due regard as required under international law. You can see they're reading the script there. And the other thing that's really important to know here, it seems the U.S. regional pilots, they've made their way all the way out to Asia. If you enjoyed this video, check out one of these two over here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.